I'm so excited to continue our Breaking Ground series as we look at the parable of the sower. I really believe that God has a word in season for you today, though it may not be a word that you want to hear. Yeah, sometimes we need to hear something that we don't want to hear, but it's good for us. It's good for our health, kind of like when I visited my doctor recently. I don't know if you guys have found this, but we all get older. You guys, any, anybody else that happened to? Yeah, I'm turning 44 at the end of this month. Yep, the ripe old age of 44. And uh, the more that I visit my doctor, the older that I get, the more she has to tell me about things that I should or should not do. And she speaks, of course, from a place of education, training. And she said, this recent visit, she said, John, your cholesterol is high, so you're going to have to lay off the fried foods. And I'm like, so like, no, less visits to zippies? What are we talking about here? And then she goes something like, um, how much bacon do you eat? Whoa, whoa, doctor. Slow your roll, doc. Let's not be getting, let's not be going that far. That's a little too intense. I mean, to tell a man like me to not eat bacon is like cutting off one of my arms, right? It's a part of me. It's who I am. It's a seasoning of life, right? And she's just like, listen, uh, you know, if you don't uh, take care of your cholesterol, you may be cutting off one of your limbs. I'm like, hey, come on now. That's, that's taking a little too far. And, and uh, of course, my wife gets my doctor's reports. And, uh, and so she uh, happens to agree with the doctor. And she just said, hey, honey, it's okay. We'll just replace that bacon with... <laughs> now, if you've been going to New Hope for any length of time, you know my feelings about turkey bacon. Right? Poultry will never be a pig, no matter how hard it tries. You should not call it bacon. It is it's turkey shaped in strips, right? It's not, it's not bacon. But my wife's point is this. She says, she says, John, a small little change like that can have such a big effect. And isn't your family worth it? Oh, come on. You guys ever... You guys ever get that from your, your, your spouses? Where they, it's just literally impossible to argue with something like that. That's what's more important, a long life or bacon? And, and I'll tell you, I kind of debated the two. It's kind of, <laughs> went, went a little back and, back and forth on that. But ultimately, she's right. And so is my doctor. Though it's something that I don't want to hear, it's what I need to hear. And so I stand before you as one who, I, I mean, I will have occasionally some bacon. But I now am a turkey bacon eater. I know you thought the day would never come. But what's more important is that I live long. That I live long for my family. I live long for my Lord. And sometimes we have to hear messages we don't want to hear. But we need to hear for the longevity of our call in God and our walk with Him. And that is certainly the message today. Because if if we're not careful, we will we'll listen to our doctor or our spouse or our pastor and say, ah, I don't really need to do that. Sometimes if we're not careful as pastors, we will not present the whole gospel because we want people to come back. We want you to, to, to enjoy being here at New Hope. And so we will tailor the message to not include things that could maybe make folks uncomfortable. And yet what the Lord has held me to as your shepherd is, John, you are not to just say things that they want to hear. You are to say things that they need to hear because that's why you've been put in this position. So in the same way where I want my doctor to tell me straight up, I want my wife to tell me what I need to hear, even though I may not want to hear it. I'm going to be doing the same thing. You know why? Because Jesus did the same thing. He never packaged his message to be something that was simply fun or nice or cozy for his audience. No, he pretty much told people straight up, life is hard. God is good. Those two things will never change. What can change, though, is if you can go through a hard life with a good God, it changes everything. You can even see that when he presents the message of the kingdom in a palatable form, like a story form, like a parable, as we're looking here in the parable of the sower, we can see that Jesus is telling us straight, this is not going to be an easy road, but there's someone who's going to walk it with you. At the top of your notes, you'll see what I'm talking about in Matthew 13, 3 through 6. Then he told them many things in parables, saying a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Okay, immediately we're getting the sense that this is not a, a cozy little fairy tale. We, we talked last week, and if you didn't hear last week's message, I'd, I'd encourage you to visit our website. We talked last week about the hardened soil of our soul and how when the seed of God's Word is planted, the devil comes along, 
to take up that seed, that word of hope and truth, before it has a chance to germinate. And that we are at war for souls. We talked about that last week, but it doesn't stop there. It continues on in the parable by saying, And some seed fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Hey, Jesus, this is getting a little depressing, right? Jesus is telling us straight up, even in the parable, this is life and life is hard. And the seed that we are going for means that you and I, sometimes we're going to endure hurt. We're going to endure pain. And in fact, part of filling in the holes of the gospel is that you and I would understand that faith will include living through the hurt. And you can fill that in your first blank there. Faith will include living through the hurt. You got to make sure we're all on the same page. But Jesus tells the parable, this is the seed represents the scripture or the good news of Jesus Christ that he's sharing with us in our hearts. The sower represents the Savior and or those people that the Savior is working through, which is us, those who follow him. He sows the seed through our lives and our example. And then the soils represent our souls. And how receptive we are to the seed or the word of God. Some more receptive than others. So we're talking hard ground of last week. Now we're talking about this rocky ground here. And Jesus explains it this way as he breaks it down for his disciples in Matthew 13, verse 20. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. So we've all been there. We all know people that have received the word of God with joy that Maybe it's a camp experience where a young person goes to camp and they raise their hand and they receive the word of God with joy and they feel like everything is going to be so much better when I get home and they get home and everything is so much worse. (laughs) Or maybe it's at a Nick Voyacek outreach like we're about to have or maybe even a service like this where you see someone raising their hand and responding to the Lord with joy and exuberance in that moment they're excited they really feel like everything's going to turn around. And then you go looking for them a week or two or a month or two after that, and you're like, what what happened to so-and-so? Hey, they don't even come to church anymore. I I I thought their lives were changed. And somewhere along the process, we have to get better as a church at helping those who have just received Christ to make sure that they understand that when you ask Christ into your heart, it doesn't mean that life is going to get easier. In fact, in my experience, it actually means life is going to get harder. Because you've just drawn a line in the sand. And you've told the one who had your soul, hands off, I belong to God. This is God's property. Do you think he's just going to sit back and go, that's great. No way. He wants that property back. And if we don't present the whole gospel and let people know that when they receive Christ, they're heading into a battle, we're setting them up for a fall. And it's dependent upon not just pastors behind a pulpit, but for each of us to surround young believers, new believers, people that have come back to Christ and let them know, listen, we are about to go into battle, but you don't got to go alone. Jesus described it this way. We take that that seed and, and it looks like it's fertile soil, right? So much, so much more so than the hard ground. We bury the seed of God's word, and from this vantage point, you just think, this is going to go great. This person's life is going to change. It's going to be such a fruitful life. But what do you guys see from your vantage point that I can't see from mine? What's just below the surface? Yeah, the bedrock, the hard things of life. And and that means that that root Instead of going deeper, it's going to try and go higher. And you and I, if we try and go higher and grow upward before we go downward, before we go deeper into the things of God, then it says when, not if, when the trials and tribulations come, we will lose faith. Haven't you guys seen that? Friends, family, they've had this moment with God. Maybe it's something you've been praying would happen in their lives forever. And then all of a sudden they encounter trials and tribulations and they look up at heaven and and shake their fists like, hey God, what's the deal? I thought everything was going to get better. 
My marriage is still awful. My finances are still bad. I still have addictions and cravings. And I thought everything was going to get better. And that's only because no one prepared them for the whole gospel. That just because we receive Jesus Christ in our heart, it doesn't mean he removes us from the hurt or the pain of life. It means we now have someone to walk through it with. The whole gospel means that I don't have to have the answers to all of life's questions as long as I'm holding the hand of the one who does. See, the whole gospel that recognizes that there's hurt and pain in the world says that I'm holding the hand of the one that will help me dig past the hurt to what's just underneath. That you and I get stopped in our growth in life and our walk with God the moment we encounter pain and trials and struggle and rejection and we say, wait a minute, wait, 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 this is too hard. No one told me it was going to be this hard. I'm going to go back to surface life because at least then everybody liked me and everything was fine when I was living my own way. And they were just about to experience the breakthrough. They were just about to experience the healing, but they didn't have anyone coaching them like Jesus was trying to do for us, coaching them to say, keep digging just under the hurt, just under the pain, just under the rejection is growth and life. There is a reservoir, a river of living water. There is soil, nutrients that your soul needs to be able to grow in Christ just beyond the hurt. But because no one told them that that life was going to hurt, guess what they assume? God's hurting them. It's not God hurting them. It's God wanting to take them through the hurt so he can heal them, and then they in turn become healers for others. You see, we live in two worlds. A world of feelings and a world of faith. And we need to acknowledge that both are there. Both are true. We feel all kinds of feelings, especially when pain, rejection, suffering, hardships comes our way. We feel those things, and God's not expecting us not to. We are not robots. But we also have the world of faith. And when you and I ask Christ into our heart, he now expects that faith will lead us through the feelings, not the other way around. But if we don't know in advance, like my doctor said, John, you do need to work on what you're eating. If we don't know in advance that when we walk out there, Life is going to be hard. Guess who takes the lead? Feelings. And our feelings become our Lord. And they keep us right on the surface. And our faith never goes deep. And I was, I was journaling on this idea in 2 Corinthians chapter 30, 10 through 11, when God sends out his messengers to go bring God's people back. I was journaling this at a staff meeting. It says... The runners went from town to town throughout Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as the territory of Zebulun, most of the people just laughed at the runners and made fun of them. Most of the people. That means this was not a very successful campaign. Everyone was mocking these messengers. However, some people from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. And I I just got held on that. I was journaling on the fact that, God, I feel like my faith is a little shallow because I like everyone to like me. Anybody else relate with that? I don't like it when people don't like me. People are mad at me, they have issues with me, totally bums me out. But if I'm not careful, I will end up wanting to please people more than pleasing the Lord. And that's a dangerous place to be because that means my faith, my obedience is surface deep. I'm only seeing what's on the outside. I have the appearance of being a Christ follower, but really I'm following people instead of the Lord. And the Lord was just kind of convicting me, like even when a, you know, someone will unlike me you know, on Facebook or someone will leave some kind of a rude comment you know, when I'm uh, telling about what Jesus has done or something like that, I'll feel like, you know, oh man, I'm, I'm totally being persecuted. Oh God, it's persecuted for my faith. I'm writing this, I'm sharing my journal because right next to me is sitting this young man that I had just met named Shalom, and he says, oh, I know what you're talking about with persecution. And he was so very nice about it, but then he started talking and realized that his level of persecution is slightly more intense than what I'm talking about. Because he is a Christian in Pakistan, which means that you are, it's literally illegal to worship the Lord. None of us had to worry that when we came in here today and we lifted up the name of Jesus that we, there was going to be reprisals or possibly death. But that's the reality that they live in. And as he's sharing his story, I'm looking at my journal going, great God, how come he had to be at my table? 
Now, don't do this. Is like this is so lousy. I'm, this is really, really shallow, you know. And uh, and as he was sharing his story, it was just it wasn't God condemning me. It wasn't him shaming me. It was him giving me the shovel, going, "Hey, John, you and I are good, but there's a deeper place to go. Let's dig. Let's dig past the hurt. Let's dig past the rejection. Let's dig past the place where you like people to like you, and let's learn." from this story. And so I want to share that story with you because uh, Shalom and Nehemiah and the John family invited, graciously invited me into their home to share their culture, their food, their music, and their faith. And as you hear their story, I want you to ask yourself and ask the Lord, God, how can I go that deep with my faith? Take a look at this. You don't realize there's something more when you've been splashing around in a puddle until you come across a pond. You don't know there's something more than that when you've been splashing around in the pond until you see the ocean. You don't realize how shallow you are until you come across something that's deeper. You think this is just how it is. And it's not a matter of comparison or shame or competition. It's a matter of calling. That God has called us to be a deep people, and that he'll bring people into our lives like the John family to speak to where we're at and say, that's good, but there is a deeper place to go that I would like to call you to so that you can endure. Did you notice the joy for people that had endured and seen many of their loved ones and friends dying for their faith? Did you notice the, the joy, the unstoppable joy that was in their lives coming through in their worship? I like how Henry Nouwen puts it. He says, people who have come to know the joy of God do not deny the darkness, but they just choose not to live in it. Joy never denies the sadness, but transforms it to a fertile soil for more joy. And I, I look at that and I just go, God, I, I keep so, I let so many things keep me from going deeper. So many things keep me from transforming the soil around me and just kind of keeping me on a, on a surface level. Like, you know, someone steals my parking lot when I'm coming to church, I feel like I'm suffering for Jesus, right? You know, when the air conditioner isn't working right here and you're, you know, we're all using our hand fans, we're like, Lord, there's gonna be another jewel in my crown in heaven because I'm suffering for you. Thank you, God. Right, I let so much of my praise be predicated upon how I feel. Like I'm gonna praise the Lord as long as I feel like like it you, and you, you just don't realize how how shallow our faith is until you come across somebody who as they decided well, we are going to die for our faith wow. because they already knew that they would die for our faith they truly lived by faith and I, my prayer is that you and I in America would not need to wait for persecution to come. I believe it will. There will be a day. But that we would not wait for that day to come. But that here and now we would grab the shovel and we would begin to dig deeper. Past the hurt. Past the pain. Past the offense. Past that insecurity that wants to be liked by everybody. And that we would understand there's a deeper place where our roots can grow deep. That we understand that faith means we're going to walk through hurt. And faith also means that we're going to give until it hurts. If you could fill that in in your second blank there. Faith means living through the hurt. Faith means giving until it hurts. And this is another one of those places where we as pastors tend to maybe, uh, we don't preach as much on this because there's been abuses in the church, people using what people give for their own ends. And so those of us who uh, do our ministries in integrity, we kind of stay away from that because the last thing we want to do is be associated with those kind of people. And yet the Lord convicted me saying, John, if you don't teach my people about giving, you're stealing from their living. How I've called them to live can only happen through giving. That one of the quickest ways to dig through the bedrock and the hardness of the selfishness of our soul is to, to give, to give of ourselves for our talent, our time, and our treasure. You can even see that in today's reading, uh, straight out of today's journal reading in, in, in Psalm 1, 1 through 3. It says this, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. I wonder how many of us could ask ourselves this question. Who am I following? Who is giving me advice? Who am I standing around with? 
I'm who am I joining in with? See, Jesus is saying, your, your faith is going to stay surfacy if you're with the wrong crowd. If you're simply following the crowd, if you're simply following what is culturally the norm and acceptable and popular, you're, you're not going to go any deeper. But if you want something that's going to last and endure the tests of life, you've got to dig. You've got to delight. Those who delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it, not just one day a week, not just every now and then, not just when things are hard, meditating on it day and night, they are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. I love that promise, not just in the good times, but every season we're bearing fruit. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Let me ask you this. How many of you guys would like to prosper in all you do? Raise your hand. Okay, if I had one, I'd hand each of you a shovel. And I'd say, start digging. Yeah. See, we, we want the benefits of being deep without the work of going deeper. We want the benefits of spending time with God without the work of actually spending that time. We like the idea of being those that can withstand the tests and the trials of life, but we don't like the idea of giving until it hurts. And yet, each of us said, I'd like where everything I do prospers. Excellent. Then let's dig. And the first way that you and I are called to dig is to delight in the right place. We're going to delight in all kinds of things, but God has called us to delight in Him, to delight in God's law of love. Now, this is a picture right here of the mighty sequoia in California. The sequoia was planted a thousand years ago. Sequoias are meant to live for 3,000 years. They go upwards of over 300 feet into the air. And of course, to be able to handle going that high, you must have a root base that goes really deep. About 130 years ago, though, the Parks Department found that people, less and less people were coming to visit the Sequoia Forest, and so they decided, well, let's, let's come up with an attraction. And so they, they hollowed out that hole in the mighty Sequoia so that back in those days, you know, cars were small enough, they could drive cars through it and or take pictures by it. And hey, it worked. But for the sake of amusement, they hollowed a hole in that mighty tree. And of course, a couple years ago, a big winter storm came. And what happens when a giant tree no longer has its roots? What happens? And this was the last of its kind. The last of the mighty sequoias fell living less than half its life expectancy for the amusement of tourists. This was the last of its kind, and my prayer is that we would not be the last of our kind. That you and I would ensure the next generation has a lasting witness to the reality of our God because we refuse to let someone hollow out our heart for the sake of amusement. Our culture is given to entertainment and amusement, to finding the next thrill, to finding the next adventure, to delighting ourselves in almost anything and everything except for the one thing that will help our roots grow deep, which is God himself and his word. You and I were made to stand the test of the hardest storms, the greatest gales, but the only way that we can is if that you and I make sure that we are delighting in God's law so that our roots can grow deep. That we would no longer be a people who seek amusement in other things, other entertainments, other thrills and people, but we would seek fulfillment in the God who made us. The God who has made us to be a testimony to the world around us. That where we are hollow, he would make us holy, that where we are shallow, he would make us deep, that where you and I are flaky, he would make us faithful, that where we are doubtful, he would make us hopeful, that he would fill in the gaps, fill in the holes of our heart that have been left by a surface society that is satisfied with simply living according to appearances instead of going deeper into the things of God. So how do we do that? How do we delight in the law of God? If that's how we go deeper in the Lord, 
What is the law of God that we're supposed to be delighting in? Well, Jesus summed it up this way in Luke 10, 27. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You see what happened there? When I am living according to my culture around me, I'm delighting myself in what John likes. I'll be involved in serving or helping other people as long as there's something in it for me. But the moment this is tiring or boring or lame or someone doesn't thank me or I get rejected, I'm out of there. But the Lord is saying, but that's just you delighting in you and that's going to keep you just on the surface. Your roots aren't going to be able to go deep. But the moment that we begin to delight in the law of the Lord vertically, guess what happens? I now find joy in delighting in what he delights in, which is serving you. You see how that flips? When I'm delighting in him, I'm spending time in his word, I'm going deeper, and I'm actually enjoying serving people. You guys ever look at our amazing servants here at New Hope? I mean, they work two or three jobs and volunteer the one day off to serve people, and no one's going around saying, hey, you better smile so you look friendly. No, it's literally coming from inside of them because they've tapped into something deeper than other people know. They understand that the closest way, the, the quickest way, the, the, the way that I can connect the most with my God is by serving those that he died for. And there's an inherent joy that comes when we are no longer serving ourselves, but we're serving those around us, and that's when we go deep. How do you dig deeper? You start by delighting in God's law. God, you get my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I'm giving my life, my time. I'm giving till it hurts serve those around me. Secondly, inhabit. Delight. Secondly, inhabit. You can feel that in your second blank there. Inhabit the ground that God has given you. We understand, of course, in the natural that it doesn't happen in a day, that I can't take this seed right here, throw it in the ground, and poof, there's a plant. We understand it takes at least 35 days for the, the, all the encoding inside of that seed to begin to sprout up and produce fruit. The first sprout doesn't happen until day 30, 35. The, before all of that time, there's something going on just underneath the surface. We understand that in the natural, but why do we not apply that to our spiritual reality? Some of us feel like, God, you're just not answering my prayers. But the truth of the matter is, he's answering our prayers. It's just below the surface. He's just not answering it in our time. And a lot of times we give up just before the harvest, just before the fruit comes. Listen, if you want fruit, you got to have root. And the only way that happens is over time. To inhabit means I am sticking in one spot so that I can bloom where I'm planted. I I want you to think about where you live right now. Where you work, where you go to school, where you go to church. Are you inhabiting there or are you just visiting? Are you fully invested there so you will see the fruit come? Or are you just biding your time until something better comes along? You see, I, I love, I just, I love these beautiful plants that Ryan and Auntie Nada put together for us. This is truly their worship to the Lord. Aren't these incredible? And, they, and they, they give this in their, their uh, business. It's called Abba's Designs. I love that name. But I need you guys to know something. Abba's design, God's design for us, is that our faith would not be potted, but it would be planted. That our faith isn't about fancy, but fruitful. That we aren't here to show off, but to show Him. That it's not about being temporary, but eternal. And yet this is what the world celebrates, right? Even the church world goes, whoa, look at how awesome they are. Look at how amazing they sound. Look at how great they look. And then, boom, they're gone. They're a flash in the pan. They're a star in the night. They got their 15 minutes of fame. And then what happened to them? Because that is not what God glories in in the kingdom of God. But when we compare this with this, well, that, that looks like a pile of dirt. Exactly. But just underneath is something that's eternal. And the only way this happens is if you and I inhabit this ground and we refuse to go anywhere else until we see the fruit come. And some of us need to hear that in our marriage right now. You're, th- you're thinking, oh, the grass looks greener on the other side. Listen, the grass is greener where you water it, where you inhabit. 
and take care of it. Some of us are ready to give up on our kids. And I'm telling you, I know it seems like nothing is happening there, like it's nothing but hard rock, but just underneath the ground, the stuff you've been investing into their life, you're about to see it come to pass. Give it time. Inhabit that ground and you will see the fruit come. Some of us need to be reminded of that even in this church. Or maybe you're like, hey, you know, this message, just a little, I don't like the whole idea of life hurts and give until it hurts. I didn't think I'm going to go check out another church where the messages are a little nicer. Listen, you can do that. In our consumeristic culture, we have people going to and fro from church to church until they find somebody to say what they agree with. But I have a commitment to you as your pastor that I'm not up here to tell you what you want to hear, but I am up here to tell you what you need to hear. And that will not change. And if that's what you're looking for, let me ask you to do this. Inhabit this ground. Dig your roots in deep. Don't live halfway here and halfway there. And if, you know, John preaches a lame sermon, I'm out of here. No, please don't. Have it dependent upon my sermons, Lord God Almighty, please. Have it be dependent upon this is where God has called you to be. And because you want to see fruit in your life and your family, this is where your roots grow deep. That way it's not dependent upon environmental circumstances or your mood for the day or how good my sermon is. But it's dependent upon the fact that God has called you to be fruitful and this is your home church. That's you. Let's dig in deep. That's the light and the law of God. Let's inhabit the ground that he's given us. Finally, let's give. Let's give like tomorrow depends on it. Because it does. You can feel that in your final blank in that acronym. Give like tomorrow depends on it. And I'm not just talking about this building initiative where you guys have been giving so much, just blown away by your generosity. Yes, that's an investment into tomorrow. That you guys would do this on top of your regular uh, 10% tithes is just mind-blowing to me. You're so incredibly generous. And I love the fact that at at the end of this month, on October 27th and 28th, for our our groundbreaking celebration, when all of the commitments and pledges come in, this church will have done something New Hope has never done before. And we will have given over $7 million. Can we give God glory for that, you guys? Come on. That's amazing. But all the amazing things that New Hope has done in our storied history of 23 years, we've never built anything permanent. This is our chance to set the footing, to set the foundation for the next generation and say we will always be from the beginning and we will continue to be a church that's about giving to those around us. In fact, uh, when, when I hear, you know, I get the papers, you know, and I get the numbers and I see that we're still going to be about $2.4 million short between what it is that we need to finish the parking lot and to finish uh, the, the redoing of our building. And I go, you know what? God, how are we going to do that? And God goes, hey, John, if I could bring in $7 million, what's 2.4? Come on. Amen. And he just goes, John, I've taken you this far. I'm going to take your church all the way. I don't know how he's going to do it. But if you had told us a couple years ago, hey, these folks, we're all going to come together and we're going to give this much, I would have gone, oh, I don't know how we're going to do that. But God's done it already. If he's already covered this much ground, what's this much ground? And I believe that God is stirring inside of some of our hearts that come the end of this month. We're going to say, you know what? I'm digging in a little deeper and I'm going to be a part of closing that gap so this church does not have to get a loan and we do not have to inhibit the budget so we can reach out even more to the world around us. In fact, we're using our building to do exactly that. We, uh, we came across this really great thing uh, that we're going to be putting on top of our roof and we're going to be putting on top of our parking lot and it's called vertical aeroponics. And Wendy's helping us out with this. And you add a nutrient solution to water that helps you because ground is, you know, very hard to come by. And so you put this, and we happen to have a lot of sun. So you put these on top of roofs where you get a lot of sun, and then you get all of this natural produce that comes. So not only are we going to be able to use this produce for our cafe that's also going to be here to serve our community, but we're going to use a portion of what we grow to give to our community in need. 
You know how expensive it is here to get fresh produce? Well, how awesome would it be to be a church in the community that is able to come to those who cannot afford produce and say, you know what? We have dedicated that a portion of everything that we grow is going to go to those who cannot afford it. And that is what it means to be givers. That is what it means to be a church that's saying, this is not about a parking lot. This is about people. And this is about us setting ourselves up to invest heavily into this season so we can harvest massively in the next one. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 puts it this way. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly in response to pressure, for God gives a person, loves a person who gives cheerfully. You see, growing deeper isn't a momentary experience. It's a daily expression. Whereas we work through the hurt, live through the hurt, and give until it hurts. God helps us to dig deeper than we ever thought we'd be able to go. And we find that real living is just below the surface. Is it hard to give? Yeah, it is. Is it hard to endure hurt? Yes, it is. But just below that is fruitfulness and harvest and that joy that some of us have been lacking in our life. And we're about to receive communion and Scripture is very clear when it comes to communion that we would examine our hearts. So I always want to give us an opportunity to do exactly that. To examine our hearts and ask if our faith is is real or if it's just surfacy. Ask yourself if we have a true relationship with Jesus Christ or it's just kind of out of convenience. What brings me to that question is one of the stories that I heard as I sat in the living room of the Johns and, and the father, Albert, shared with me this story. He said that, There was a terrorist threat against the church. That if they came and worshiped that night, that there would be a terrorist attack. And yet instead of everyone staying home, twice as many people showed up to worship Jesus that night. Because they determined as a community of faith, we will not let the enemy tell us when we can worship our God. And ultimately our God is the one who numbers our days. And I just look at that and I go, wow. And he said, There was this point where one of the fathers was standing at the door and he noticed a man coming straight for the church. And it was clear that he had ordnance strapped to his body. And he realized that he wasn't going to have time to be able to empty the church. And he made a decision in that moment to go straight to that man that was a suicide bomber and to put his arms around him and hug him until he exploded the ordnance, taking the full brunt of the explosion on his own body in order to save the lives of everybody in that church. And as you take communion today, please understand that Jesus took the full brunt of our sin and our shame and our debt so that you and I could worship him for eternity. Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Before we take communion, I want to make sure you know the God behind the communion, the one who laid his life down for you. I want to make sure you have a personal relationship with him. And maybe you did at one point, but because life has been hard, maybe there's distance between you and the Lord. Or maybe you you just received Jesus at a certain level, but when the hard things of life began to happen, you kind of walked away. Maybe you've never really known a real faith in Jesus. This is your opportunity. He's crafted this entire moment, the, all, everything that's gone in just for this moment right here that will literally change you for eternity. And I want to invite you, if you're saying, that's me, John, I want to know Jesus for real. I want a faith that's real. I want a faith that goes deep and can help me to endure whatever life throws at me. Just raise your hand right now. Say, I want to know the real Jesus. Yeah, all over the room, all over the room. Yep, all over the room. Thank you. Up there in the mezzanine, thank you. Uh, if, if you're online right now, just raise that hand. If you're in one of our venues, raise that hand. Thank you. Anybody else? This is not about the people sitting next to you. This is about you and the Lord. You Don't be afraid of what anyone else thinks. Remember, this is you going deep. Are you going deep? You're saying, I really need to know you, Jesus. Anyone else? Anyone else? Raise that hand. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. Yep. I see those hands too. Thank you so much. Let's pray together as one voice. If you could repeat after me to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking my sin upon yourself 
on the cross. Thank you for rising from the dead so that I could have eternal life with you in heaven and a full life here and now. I repent for my sin. I receive your forgiveness. I'm going deep in you, Lord. I'm not staying on the surface anymore. I give my life to worship you and to serve those around me. Thank you for setting me free. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate that, you guys? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Praise God. Praise God. As the elements are being passed right now, I just ask that you would just hold on to the cup and hold on to the bread, and we're going to be taking the elements together. But as they do, I want to invite each of you who have prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, right in the seat pocket in front of you is what we call a yes packet. You've said yes to Jesus, and we want to say yes with you. Take that yes packet and go to one of our guys at the exits or at our connections kiosk under the Ohana tent, and we want you to trade that yes packet in for a free Bible as we celebrate the most eternal decision you can ever make. And right now, as these elements are being passed, I want you to just consider what it means that God would love you that much, that he would give you his life. I want you to ask the Lord as we pass these elements what it means to delight in him, to inhabit the ground that he's given us, and to give like tomorrow depends on it. Just hold on to these and we'll take these together in a moment. We lift these elements to you, Lord. We understand that we have a powerful and a poignant picture right in our hands of what the whole gospel looks like. Because you came and were hurt in a way that no man has ever been hurt, wounded and bruised and broken for our transgressions. You were broken so that we could be made whole in a very harsh world so we could know healing both in heaven for eternity and healing here and now. This is how much you love us. And this juice, God, that we hold, it represents the fact that you didn't just give us a little bit, now you bankrupted heaven by sending your son to die for us. That his precious and pure blood was poured out for us so it would cover over a multitude of sins, everything we've ever said and done, covered by you. What a picture of grace. 
And that now, God, you've given us the opportunity to be able to share this whole message, this whole gospel, God, with the whole world, Lord, that people would know this is how much you love us. And God, we can't earn it. We don't deserve it. There's no way for us to pay it back. But we can pay it forward. So we're going to a deeper place in our worship, in our prayer, in our faith, in our life, because we know we are loved by the one who made us, the one who died for us, the one who set us free. And we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's partake. Thank you for your body, Jesus. Thank you for your blood, Jesus.